I now come to our memory verse. So again, if uh, you've had a little bit of a rest, let's go ahead and please stand once again. And uh, let's read our memory verse. And this is one that uh, we will go over again one more time next week. So hopefully you'll remember it by then because it's an important verse, particularly when it comes to the issue of conflicts and resolution. Romans 12, 18. Please read this with me. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And we'll cover this text, actually, too. So let's pray. Gracious God, our Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for the cross. Lord, may you speak to us today through your word as we continue to look at conflicts, resolution, uh, and character, and so many other things that are so important to us as individuals and as a church. May you teach us today. May you encourage us. May you convict us. And may you change us. For the glory of Christ is in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we are pausing in our series on Jude to talk about growing through conflicts and resolution, reconciliation. This is part three, and uh, Lord willing, we'll have one more uh, in this series uh, next week and finish up this uh, very important series. We all face conflicts sooner or later in some way, shape, or form. And we started this, we... Uh, Define conflict. We describe some of the causes of and the personalities within conflict. Uh, we also ended with principles from Philippians 2 uh, about uh, the mindset that we should have within conflict. Have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, humility, serving. In part two, last week, I reminded us that we cannot escape conflict. It will happen sooner or later. That's part of life. We cannot escape it. We also touched on principles uh, based upon Jesus' teaching. Uh, what, what we need to do if somebody has something against us. And that is we go to that person and make it right. We also looked at Matthew 18 for principles that if we sin against someone, what we are to do. Go to that person and make it right. So either way, we are to go to the individual and make it right. And either way, we are responsible. You are responsible to go to the offended party and deal with the situation. To do what is right in God's eyes. To deal with that problem and to make it right. And we do this in faith. Because it can be very scary. It can be, it's, it's fearful, by the way, too. So there's issues of fear that we have to overcome when it comes to that. But as best as we can, we do it in faith, trusting the Lord for the outcome, whatever it is. Doesn't mean things are going to go great. But it does mean we follow Him to do what He wants us to do. Then we looked at Galatians. Um, chapter 6, and the purpose of confrontation. The purpose of confrontation. And if you know our Facebook and YouTube, or Facebook and Twitter, I put this upon there this past week. The goal of confrontation is not the humiliation of someone, but rec reconciliation with someone. Read that again. The goal of confrontation is not the humiliation of someone, but reconciliation with someone someone. That is the purpose. Paul mentions that in Galatians 6, and we studied that. We also saw the principles. We saw this, by the way, in, in every single text. Reconciliation. Trying to make things right, bring harmony back into relationships, personal relationships as best as we can. And then last, we looked at three principles from James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 about our response and what it should be if somebody confronts us with something. One, we're to listen. Two, we're not to get defensive. And three, we're to be careful of our anger because emotions run high when those kinds of situations occur. So that's what we looked at the past few weeks, just as a quick quick reminder. And at times, we may need to defend ourselves. We understand that, too. I'm not talking about physically, which we need to do, uh, but there are you know, certain accusations at times. Um, but we can even do that without becoming defensive. And it's about our attitude. That's what it's about. Now, today we're going to look at actually two conflicts in Scripture and then Christian character. One conflict we'll look at is in Acts 15, and the second is Galatians 2. So that's kind of where we're going to be going, but I'm going to look at Christian character in Romans 12. So those are the three main texts that we're going to be looking at today. So you can go ahead and turn to Acts 15 if you want, and we'll get there here in just a few minutes. And as a reminder, when we look at Acts 15, that chapter is about conflict. We looked a little bit at that on the first uh message in this series. There was the issue of the Jews and Gentiles and what to do with them. Do they need to follow the law or not? 
big, big issue in the early assembly. Then we find the situation which we'll look at here in just a few minutes. And the question, of course, was should the Gentiles follow the law? And of course, the answer is no. We, looked, we talked about that a little bit. But the second section is where we're going to pick it up in verse 36. In verse 36. And this section we find the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. So we're going to be looking at verses 36 through 41. So if you are able to do again, I know we're doing a little bit more of this now, but if you would please stand as we uh, do read this text. In honor of God's word and of the God who wrote his word. Acts 15, 36 through 41. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had gone out with them to the work, and not gone out with them to the work. And there occurred a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Once again, let's pray. Again, our God and Father, we depend upon you. May you bless this time. May you bless this study. May you teach us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So on Paul's first missionary journey, which you can read about before this section in Acts, Barnabas and Paul were teammates. Uh, they had taken John Mark. You find that in Acts 13, verse 5. But then a few verses later, in verse 13, John Mark left, and he went to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know why. We're not told why. But it did occur right after a situation with a false prophet and a magician uh, who was also involved in the occult. Maybe that scared him. We don't know. Maybe there was something pressing and he wanted to do at home. Maybe he freaked out. Maybe he was a coward. We don't know. Maybe something came up. Again, we're not told specifically what the situation was. But in any case, he went to Jerusalem to stay there. But that brings us to the text we just read. Paul says, hey, Barnabas, let's go on another trip. Let's see how everybody's doing. Let's go come, let's talk to them, see how, the, how everything is going where we ministered before, and even go beyond that. Let's go. Barnabas said, okay, that's a great idea. Let's bring John Mark with us. Hmm. We find Paul's perspective on Mark's leaving. His perspective was, well, Mark deserted us. He left. So whatever the situation was, Paul says, no, we're not bringing him. He's not coming with us. Barnabas, I want to, I want to bring him. No, yes, no, yes. And partly because Barnabas and Mark were cousins, that may have been a factor to that, by the way. But they could not agree, and a, quote, sharp disagreement occurred. Now, this is actually one word in Greek. It's a very strong word. It's only used two times in the New Testament. It's used here, but it's also used in Hebrews 10, 24. It's a different context, but it's just as strong of a word in that text, too. And here, this word actually means a provocation which literally jabs or cuts someone so they must respond. This is not a, a soft word here. The idea here is passion, violent anger, dissension, problem that took place here. We would call it in our culture a shouting match between Barnabas and the Apostle Paul. good time. And this division was so pronounced, so sharp, that they had to separate from each other. Barnabas took Mark, they went to Cyprus, possibly where he was from. Paul took Silas, and they went out. And actually the text does say they commended them to, to the work. But you know what? It's really hard for us to think about this. You know, when we read the book of Acts or something like that, sometimes we just read these things, we don't actually stop and think. This is a very serious matter. We think, well, Paul and Barnabas, they, they had this knock-down, drag-out fight? Yeah, they did. 
You know, one reason we know the Bible is reliable as the Word of God is because it shows people as they really are. Warts and all, problems and all, struggles and all, life and all. Other writings don't do that. And disagreements and all. Here we have two Christians, two leaders, nonetheless. The apostle to the Gentiles himself. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, which is what his name means. A very important individual in the early assembly. Going at it, similar like we would say, like mixed martial arts, except verbally. The cage match. So to speak. Now, when we first began this study, I talked about different personalities. This may have been the case here. We know that Paul is a very strong personality. Maybe Barnabas was also strong. We don't know. Maybe he was not as strong. We do know he stood up for Mark. So he was not a coward. <coughs> he wasn't a wimp. But we do know that different personalities are one of the major reasons for conflict in life. It happens. Two strong personalities can have conflict. Someone who's a strong personality, somebody who's not as strong, they can have conflict. Somebody who has two not very strong personalities can also have conflict. It doesn't matter because we will have conflict with people sooner or later. This may have been a factor here, we don't know. But the thing is, the conflict was over the different beliefs, which we also covered, and different perspectives which we covered also in the first lesson, if you remember. Paul wanted one thing, Barnabas wanted another. What was that? It was all about John Mark. He was in the middle. I wonder what he felt. I wonder what he thought if he was there. Paul says, we're not going to take him because in his mind, he was a deserter. And we're going to be going on another trip. This one's going to be longer was to keep it from deserting us again. If you've ever been on the mission field, and by the way, every single one of us as a Christian is on the mission field every single day. You don't have to go overseas to be on the mission field. You are a missionary where you are. But if you've ever gone overseas in particular, and for whatever reason somebody leaves the team, it is hard. <coughs> It is painful. It is difficult. There is a sense of betrayal. You made this commitment, and now you're shirking on your commitment. It happens, unfortunately. Now, there are factors we can't control. Sometimes a parent gets sick or a child gets sick. That's another matter. That's not what I'm referring to. <coughs> but it's hard. And it can cause a lot of difficulties, particularly in other countries. And Paul had the mission in mind. He says, we're going there. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. I want to make sure that the people I go with are trustworthy. But then there's Barnabas. Maybe he wanted to give John Mark another chance. Maybe he knew something Paul didn't know about the previous situation. Maybe um, <clears throat> Barnabas knew that Mark had really recognized his fault. <clears throat> we don't know. We don't know. But whatever it was, Paul didn't know. But all Paul thought of was Mark left, end of story. No, maybe Mark, Barnabas thought, well, Mark has changed. It probably was only maybe about six months or so in between this, so it wasn't very, a very long time uh, ish, roughly. Um, now, this is, of course, speculation, but there are some inferences in the text, too. We know what Paul's perspective was. Paul didn't like it. He left. He left us. He left the work. He's not coming along. Barnabas, but. We need to bring him along. Give him another chance. No! Hmm. So whatever the situation was, neither of them was going to budge their position. And Scripture does not say that one was right and the other was wrong. It records 100% accurately what did occur without commentary, aside from Paul's perspective. And I understand both sides. I can understand both sides. I can understand wanting to give somebody a second chance. But I also understand these things are not easy. And if you're not going to be committed, you don't need to come along. This fight was extremely intense. 
So much so they separated. But we do read later in the New Testament that God used Mark in a mighty, wonderful way. Well, what happened? He wrote the Gospel of Mark. God was not finished with him. At the end of Paul's life, about 67 AD, he actually asks for Mark to be with him. Listen to what 2 Timothy 4.11 says. Paul said this, Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. So whatever happened, hey, Mark is now useful again. He's proven himself faithful. He's useful for me for service. <coughs> Colossians 4.10, written about five years or so before uh, the, the Paul's death, so about 62 AD, Paul tells them, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin, Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Hmm. So somehow Mark was reconciled to Paul. Now, no text says that Paul and Barnabas served the Lord together, but 1 Corinthians 9, 6, written about 54 AD, Paul refers to Barnabas as working in mission work. So they obviously had some kind of connection once again. So this indicates Barnabas continued to serve the Lord in ministry because we need to remember he was very important in Paul's life. It was Barnabas who actually introduced Paul to the other apostles in Jerusalem. And in my mind, I truly believe, though they may never, never serve together, there was a respectful, loving relationship after this argument, some way, somehow, that took place. We looked at a few texts that indicate Mark and Barnabas. Now, we don't know all the details, of course, because we don't have that. We can ask, ask them both when we get to heaven and say, so guys, tell me, what happened? What in the world were you guys doing? And how did you come back together again after such a sharp disagreement? I suspect one of the things that we both say is God's grace. Because we knew we needed to do the right thing in God's eyes. Perhaps. Sometimes even between Christians, there will be disagreements you can't get past. Maybe a secondary doctrinal matter, maybe a political issue. Maybe a church government, maybe how to spend a budget, maybe style of worship, maybe something completely different as it was here in this text. But we need to recognize that in Paul's mind, this was a gospel issue. Now, I want to be very careful here. Now, this was a historical event. We need to be very careful about applying certain principles to it, but I do believe there's some principles we can learn from this. And there are times to separate from others for a short period of time. To deal with things, to get through some things, perhaps. But the desire should always be to come back together again. And that's what we see here. And by the way, I'm not referring to physical abuse. We mentioned this a little bit in our Sunday school. If that is occurring, leave, call the police, get some help. I know it's in that situation, it can be very hard to do that. What I'm referring to here is differences in theology, ideas, things like that. But if separation does happen, it should be done cordially if possible. And I suspect maybe the Lord can make the both of them eventually says, you guys did not part ways the right way. You need to go back and deal with the problem. Separation can occur during a fight. There should always be an attempt to repair that relationship on a one-on-one -on -one level. <clears throat> Sometimes we can't. I understand that. I'm sure many of us have had relationships that are no longer there because of one thing or another that cannot be fixed. They cannot be reconciled. It takes two for reconciliation. It takes two. Even if we do our part, the other party may not be able to accept it. I understand that. Ideally, restoration takes place, but in reality, it doesn't always happen. And it does break our hearts. And when it comes to issues, there are some things we will not agree on with others. And to keep the peace, we may need to separate for a period of time. 
So I say, I say that with caution. That's not the ideal. But there are times it should take place. But the desire should always be to reconcile. We see that here in the text. That is not down arguments, but some way, somehow, a relationship was developed later on. And that's the idea. Now we come to the second one, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. So I'll give you a chance to turn there or click there. I don't have this text up on the board, or up on the board, up on the uh, screen, because I want you to look it up, and I want you to look at it for yourself. Galatians chapter 2. Paul's letter to the those in Galatia. <clears throat> a very important letter. Uh, contrasting law and grace. And this is Paul and Peter. Two apostles. Starting in verse 11. But when Cephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Hmm. Why? Because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof that is far away, fearing the party of the circumcision, fearing these Jewish brothers in Christ. Verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all. So this is not done in private here. If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in, that's we as in, we Jews have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Justified means declared righteous by God and in a good relationship with him. So for Paul... Biblical and gospel issues were of the utmost importance. Those were the things that were worthy of dividing over. Because in his mind and in our minds, there should be no compromise when it comes to God's truth. Now, some say the situation Paul's referring to here was uh, at or before the time in Acts 15, 1 and 2. You can do more study on that. We're not given a specific date for this one. You can study more on that. But we have to say, okay, well, what is this situation described here in Galatians 2? Well, first, let me give you a map here. I know it's kind of hard to see. But over here, this is Antioch in Syria. This was Paul's base of operations for his mission trip. Trips, rather. Down here we have Jerusalem in Judea and Israel. So there's quite a little bit of a distance up to Antioch. <clears throat> now, his first missionary journey was quite short. You know, up here... Down there to Cyprus, that's where they had John Mark, and to Antioch. For some reason, John Mark went down to Jerusalem again, we don't know why. The second trip started in Antioch, went all the way here, you see this, the green line. Went to Caesarea, then he went down to Jerusalem. So it was a long trip. His uh, third trip was long too. His journey to Rome was the purple one here, and some say after his imprisonment, he actually went on another trip over to Europe. <coughs> but what's going on here? So, there, so what happened was they were in Antioch in Syria. Paul was there, north of Israel. Um, Peter was visiting. And he was gladly eating with the Gentiles. Oh, brothers, fellowship in Christ. That's wonderful. Let's eat together. Let's have a, a meal together, which is very important in that culture. Because to have a meal together means acceptance. Like in some cultures around the world today. It's not just, oh, let's go out and grab a cheeseburger. You know, and then, you know, oh, chit chat, chit chat, okay, we're done. That's more of an American thing. <laughs> in other cultures, it's not that way. You can have a meal for two hours. You may not even touch the meal and still talk. <laughs> the, but the, the, the purpose is fellowship. The purpose is I have accepted you as someone in my life, and I want to spend time with you. So this was not just a, a meal to glaze over. So Peter was eating with the Gentiles who had trusted by faith in Jesus apart from the law 
And James, the brother of Jesus, a leader in the Jerusalem church, the Jerusalem assembly, has sent some fellow Jewish followers of the Messiah to Antioch. So they were down here. You know, hey, let's send some folks up here, see how things are going. Because this was actually the, the next major church plant, you could say, after Jerusalem, historically. Their presence made Peter nervous. He became fearful. So much so that he stepped away from eating with the Gentiles. Okay, I no longer accept you as part of the family. That's a problem. Maybe they were eating non-kosher food. We don't know. Maybe they're eating pork. And Peter was joining in. Oh, that's great bacon. I like that. <laughs> Maybe that they were just Gentiles. Oh, I can't fellowship with those people because they're Gentiles. They're unclean in the eyes of Jews. We really don't have an idea about how important of an issue this was in, this, in the book of Acts. It was a major issue. This was an insult to the Gentile believers. It would have made them feel like second-class citizens. It was a horrible, horrible decision on Peter's part. But not only the hypocrisy of Peter, but of course his influence affected other people. Now he was first eating with the Gentiles, but of course these fellow Jewish believers show up. Okay, stepping away. The Gentile believers are probably like, what, what's going on here? What did we do? What have we said? What have we done? Have we offended you? What, what's going, what's, what's happening? Because of the fear of Peter. And because, again, Peter was a major leader. I mean, this is the guy that preached at Pentecost. This is the guy that opened the door to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. His actions negatively influence others, so guess what? They too left eating with the Gentiles. This communicated that the Gentiles had become, had to become Jews in order to be accepted. That was a problem. That was false. That was a lie. <laughs> and Paul would have none of this. So what did he do? He confronted Peter publicly who was condemned by his actions and by his hypocrisy. Paul rebuked him before every single one of them. He said, Peter, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live like the Jews? Why are you doing this? We can't even fulfill the law. Why are you expecting them to fulfill it? They can't. <clears throat> they don't even have the law. And Paul, by the way, is not insulting the Gentiles in verse 15 where he says, we're not sinners by, you know, like the Gentiles. He's not re referring to them as you know, second-class citizens. But he's actually reminding Peter that the Gentiles cannot follow the law of God. They don't have it. They never had it. How can we expect them to live up to these kosher rules when they have no idea what they are? How can we expect them to follow the festivals when they don't have a clue about where they came from or why they even celebrate them? To expect them to live up to the law is unbiblical. And verse 16 is the main point. Of course, they couldn't even keep it perfectly as Jews. Look at verse 16. Jews and Gentiles are not justified again, declared righteous by God with a life that has changed by doing the law. But how? By faith. By faith. By faith alone, in Christ alone, based upon God's word alone, for God's glory alone. Now there's a principle, by the way, for a leader that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 5.20, about rebuking an elder publicly who persists in sin. Not somebody who's you know, caught in one fault or anything like that. But why? To bring them to repentance and restoration. <clears throat> that is why Paul did this publicly. Because this is something that Peter was continually doing. This is not just one of this is, again, Paul says he was condemned in his hypocrisy. 
And because of that condemnation, he had to address this publicly because other people were being affected. So 1 Timothy 5.20, rebuke an elder publicly who is persisting or continuing in sin without repentance. So here, in Galatians, this was not a minor issue. This is not a minor matter. Peter was free to eat whatever he wanted, when he wanted. He could eat kosher if he wanted to. He could, eat, he could also eat pork with the Gentiles if he wanted to. But his actions were contrary to grace. And he needed to be rebuked. And Paul did it. And when it comes to issues, doctrinal issues should be the primary reason for confrontation and separation. Now, there are other things we'll discuss, Lord willing, next time, next week. But we must not compromise the gospel. We must not compromise biblical truth and its application. We must not compromise what salvation really is about. We must not compromise the deity of Christ, the triunity of God, the reliability of Scripture, and more. When it comes to those issues, there is no question. But what about our character? What about who we are? We've looked at two examples of confrontation here. Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Peter. But what about character? How does that come in? How does that fit into these kinds of situations? Even though Paul was very blunt and very straightforward and very open when, his, when he rebuked Peter, he did it because of love. He did it because of truth. He did it because of the consequences of what was going to take place if he would have let it slide. That brings us to Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. Christian character. So if you would turn to Romans 12, please, or click there. We're going to look at verses 1 through 18, and we're going to read them all. Romans 12. Give you a second to click there or turn there. Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service or act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what it, the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we are many members in one body, and all the members <clears throat> do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches in his teaching. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another, and do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, here's our verse, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. 
This is about Christian character. So after 11 chapters of doctrine, Paul gets to the living out section of Romans, the application section, some say. After everything he wrote, he says to voluntarily, because of God's grace towards you, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice and don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. Well, how do you do that? By living out and knowing the truth. And to do it in love. When we offer ourselves to God, then we are able to have the character Paul exhorts every Christian to have. Starting in verse 3. Now, we're not going to go through everything, but a few highlights here, by the way. He first starts with humility. We've seen this over and over and over again. Arrogance and pride will not help any situation. Humility will. He also starts with sound judgment or discernment. Thinking clearly about something and someone. Verses 4 through 8 talk about spiritual gifts. And you know what? If you're a Christian, you have at least one spiritual gift. I don't know what that is. You may not know what that is. All of us have been gifted by God to serve Him in the body of Christ. And you know what? Everyone should have a desire and everyone should have the opportunity to serve as they are gifted to do so. So where do you fit in? What, are you, what is your gift or gifts spiritually? Maybe serving? Maybe leading? I know pastors always like, oh, that giving gift. Oh, that's a great gift. Yeah, yeah we give, yes, but liberality. It doesn't just mean money. It can, but there's a lot more to it than that. <coughs> Where does God want you to serve? You say, well, I'm not sure. What do I do? Pray. Try some things. Offer yourself to God and to others and serve them. And unless there is a biblical restriction that limits someone from serving, he or she should be able to serve. Verses 9 through 18 goes through a list of character qualities that we are to have and strive for as Christians. Now, of course, we're not going to be perfect. And there's a lot more to it than what we're actually talking about. But I just want to, again, give you some highlights here. Love genuinely. That's where he starts here. Let love be without hypocrisy. You can't be hypocritical in love at the same time. It doesn't work. Love genuinely. Hate evil. Hate those things that are against God. Hate those things that hurt people. As Christians, there are things we should hate. That's what Paul says. Hate that which is evil. Cling to what is good. I think of a baby clinging to a parent. I can't help but think about that example right now. <clears throat> Cling, hold fast to what is good. In God's eyes. Be devoted to each other in brotherly love. Hmm. Preferring one another diligently. Now the idea here is actually very interesting. Basically it's referring to a contest to see who can outdo the other in serving each other and serving the Lord. Not for outward appearance. But what a great idea within the body of Christ. How can I serve someone? Should be our question. What can I do to help others? How can I bless someone today? You know, whether it's kids at a school or a family, whether it's the body of Christ and other people. Devoted to each other. We live in a world that lacks devotion, dedication, and commitment. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. I see it all the time. But God says for us to be devoted to one another, committed to one another. 
in brotherly love. And I pray we will be. Trying to outdo one another in doing good to each other. Serving the Lord. Also, rejoicing at home. Rejoicing at home. It's kind of hard to rejoice when you have no hope. Can you click on the next one, please, Kevin? Certainly. Thank you. Persevering through problems. Persecution, too. Moving forward. Doing what God tells us to do. As individuals, as a family, as a body, as a country, as a body of Christ. <clears throat> Provide for the needs of others. Be hospitable. Hospitality was very important in the world in that day, and even to this day, in other parts of the culture of the world. Inviting people to be with you. You're going out together. Ladies' nights out. Guys' nights out. Inviting people to your home. Being hospitable. Then he kind of turns, uh, switches a little bit, and talks about those who hate you. What is your response to those who hate you? Those who are persecuting you. Bless them. Bless them and do not curse them. Do not talk bad about them. And these are those who don't like you. And rejoice with those who rejoice and cry with those who cry. Some refer to this as the ministry of presence. Just being there for somebody. When they're weeping, when they're hurting, when they're crying. Then, of course, when, when they rejoice, it's great to rejoice with them. This is part of what it means to be the body of Christ. This is what we are to strive for as individuals and also as a church. And as in Philippians, he says again in verse 16, be of the same mind. Do not be arrogant. Spend time with those who are lowly. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think you know it all. Because you don't. None of us do. Which again brings us back to be humble. There's humility. Then don't take vengeance. <clears throat> don't take vengeance. And it's very easy to take vengeance when somebody does something or says something to us. Particularly if that person is a quote unquote enemy. Because we want to get back at them. Get them. Stick it to them. Stick that knife and twist it. Oh yeah, that feels good. Yeah. It's not God's way. Respect what is right. And as much as you can, as best as you can, be at peace with everyone. Having these qualities helps overcome many differences, but it also helps when you have to confront someone or confront a problem. Because when we put others before ourselves, conflict changes. Confrontation changes. It doesn't erase the conflict. Doesn't mean we throw away our convictions. Doesn't mean we will agree. Doesn't mean we compromise or cease to be ourselves. But it does mean that we know when to speak, what to speak, when to be silent, and when to let go of things. And we all need this in our lives. As individuals, as families, as the church, not just here, but nationwide. And we cannot do this in our own strength. We can only do it with the power of God. We can only do it by His Spirit. Not by might nor by power to quote the Old Testament, but only by His Spirit. Because these things are not natural to us. These are supernatural things. So as we finish up today, we looked at two different conflicts, two different, different gospel conflicts. Yeah, we can disagree on some things, but we first must keep the purity of biblical doctrine and its application in our lives. We have preferences, we have issues of conscience, we'll talk about that one really next time. Matters of opinion and more. But what do we do with these differences? We deal with them as needed which is why we're doing this short series. 
But here's the thing. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you cannot live out a life like we've been describing today. So if you're here, if you're watching, listening, or watching later, you will have conflicts, but you have no ability in yourself to do these things God's way. You cannot do it. Why? Because you're lost and without God's grace. What do you do? Turn away from your sin and trust in Christ alone for salvation. Give your life to Him. And when we do give our lives to Him, He does command us to be baptized after salvation and to be part of a local fellowship. And grace left Him fulfill both of those. We are not perfect, but we are learning. And my fellow believers, Christians, what is God working in your heart? Whether you're here, again, maybe watching, listening later. What are you thinking of now? What situation are you thinking of? What people or person are you thinking of right now? Whatever it is, pray. Think very long and very hard and ask the Lord what he wants you to do. Here's the question. Are you willing to make things right? To go to that person and to discuss those issues and those matters. That's God's way. Maybe you struggle with those who are very black and white in their perspectives or their opinions. Maybe you struggle with those who say there's some gray areas. Well, that's their personality. You accept them. But we need to be very careful not to try to say people need to live up to our personal standards rather than biblical standards. And when there is conflict, here's the thing. Can we keep things biblical and God-honoring and do it his way? Because here's what this whole issue is about. Are we being conformed to his image daily? Or do you think that, quote, going to church is just a thing to do on Sundays? The way we grow through conflict is to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what this is about. And the question is, are we willing to change? Now, as we finish up today, very, very important things to think about and consider today. <clears throat> I know it's we, we've been uh, limiting some of the songs, but it's because of this, the focus of this series. If there is conflict, it's hard to worship the Lord. You can't. Not from the heart. So that's why I've said, when we sing these songs, let them be our prayer. When I survey the wonders of my richest gain I count but loss. And I pour contempt on all my pride. In the songs of the past few weeks as we've been singing them, I said, let this be your prayer to God today. And all. That he would make a change in our lives, a change in our hearts, because this is what this is about. And again, this is not an academic exercise. This is not a theoretical topic. I'm sure if I asked us all, we've all faced conflict this past week. I know I have. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Whether it is with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, or if those watching are at school, schoolmates, whatever the case is. <clears throat> now I know sometimes other parties have to be involved. I understand that. We'll talk about that next time. But what is God working in your heart like? You know I love you all. And I want God's best for you. And I know some of the things that some of you are facing. And it breaks my heart. And I wish I could fix everything. Whether it's a roof or whether it's a you know, situation with your family or friends or whatever the case is. I know life is hard. we're in this together. So let's deal with the differences biblically. According to God's way. Because honestly, if we want God's blessing, we have to do things as well.
him, but I'm going to do things his way. If we can try everything that we can as a church, it's not going to go anywhere. Even if we grow in number, we're still not going to grow. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is very clear. Conflicts occur. Now we saw two of them, two situations, two very different situations with the Apostle Paul and his life and his ministry. And Lord, there are things that we don't understand why they take place. But Lord, I pray that whatever is going on in our lives, that you will intervene, that you will give us strength, that you will help us to deal with whatever needs to be dealt with. First in our own hearts, our own attitudes, our own struggles, but then with other people too. Please, God, move in us and move among us to do things your way. Not just when it comes to conflict, of course, but when it comes to living out Christian character. And when we look at this, we think, wow, I fall so far short, and I know I do. So, Father, work in my heart and work in our hearts today to develop Christ-like So, Lord, as we've been <clears throat> going through these lessons we've been building, and I pray they are helping, they are encouraging, and they are challenging to us all. Because as we have said, we all have a part in this. So work in our lives, work in our hearts to change us and to mold us. For you are the potter and we are the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray as we sang last week. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you, Lord, that we can do these things in faith and that we can trust you for the outcome, however difficult it may be presently, knowing that you will bless in the long run. So we look forward, Lord, to what you will do in our lives as you conform us, as you change us, as we learn to glorify you more and more every single day. For it's in the name of the wonderful Lord, a wonderful Savior and soon returning King, even Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> a few uh, upcoming things coming up here. <clears throat> Again, we have the uh, connection cards. They're on your table. If you haven't finished filling those out, please do so because the offering plates can be on your